I'd like to ask you to take a moment to think about the places where you live, work, and play. Now imagine those same spaces and imagine them being transformed as technology becomes an active component in everything that you see and touch. For the first time in human history, with the deployment of satellites, sensors, RFID tags, and GPS-enabled smartphones, we're able to collect, analyze, and visualize vast amounts of data and make sense of the physical environment around us. This presents exciting opportunities to tackle systemic complex challenges such as climate change, crime, aging infrastructure. But it should also raise concerns for those of us who are not actively involved in the design and development of these new products and services. It should actually raise questions for us as citizens who are interested in shaping the discourse and the introduction of these technologies into our everyday lives. In the area where I work as a practitioner in foresight and innovation in the engineering industry, I can see that cities are changing with the evolution of technology and its integration into the urban fabric. It's generating new concepts of our cities, concepts you may have heard of, such as smart cities. For some time now, smart cities have been promising us with the fulfillment of new cities that are both more efficient structurally and functionally. Why has this come about? Well, the unprecedented availability of computing power means that it's now both faster and cheaper to process data. Emerging data analysis and visualization techniques means that we're now better able to understand the flows and the relationship of assets like energy, water, transport within our cities. According to Cisco, by 2010, 12.5 billion devices were connected to the internet. By the end of 2015, they've predicted that 25 billion devices will be connected to the internet. That's three and a half times the size of our global population of 7.2 billion. And by 2020, they're predicting that 50 billion devices will be connected to the internet. That's six and a half times the size of our population. According to research conducted for the UK Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, the smart cities market will be worth more than $400 billion by the year 2020. That represents big business and is drawing a lot of investment to this area. As a result of this investment, we are seeing interesting developments. For a start, we're able to see new patterns in the world around us. This is an image of global flight patterns. The streaks of light represent 58,000 flights across the world, and the concentration of light represent hot spots of activity. Because of what we're now able to see, we can better understand and communicate the impacts of our actions and decisions. New visualization tools are enabling us to develop more collaborative approaches to design by engaging more stakeholders in the design and decision-making process. This is the Motor City Mapping Initiative, which was developed by the, task removal, the Blight Removal Task Force in Detroit, along with a few key partners, like Data Driven Detroit. They set up a survey to assess the residential and commercial blight in Detroit, and they invited the community to get involved by actually taking the survey, snapping some pictures, and answering a few online questions each time they mapped out a, a, a par property parcel. In just a matter of 36 days, 150 community volunteers were able to capture approximately 380,000 property parcels one of the largest initiatives like this ever undertaken. In phase two, the community was yet again invited to review and update the online survey, which was available to all. And in phase three, as a result of the community's input, the Blight Removal Task Force acted on this information. On the other side, what's concerning is the accelerated introduction and proliferation of new tech products and services. 
The compressed release cycle means that there's a continuous deployment of new products and new features to existing products. This means larger releases at larger scales in more of our neighborhoods without our knowledge until they appear on our streets. And before you know it, everything in our lives is being quantified with and without our consent. So at this point, you may be wondering, what is a smart city? What does a quantified community look like? Hudson Yards is the largest private real estate in the history of the United States. It's the largest development in New York City since the Rockefeller Center. The site will include 17 million square feet of commercial and residential space, along with 14 acres of public space. The developer plans to make this public square the smartest one in New York City. It also plans to make this district the most resilient with the integration of an energy microgrid and smart infrastructure. The vision for this quantified community plans to measure noise, noise pollution, air quality, energy and water usage. And if they're successful, the next time a Hurricane Sandy hits, while other parts of the, of the city get affected, their tenants won't. Another example of a quantified community is Red Hook. The Red Hook initiative has actually focused on helping to focus important life skills through its Red Hook Wi-Fi Digital Stewards program. The Red Hook neighborhood has 11,000 residents. 70% of the population lives in public housing. They have no subway service, and there's limited internet access. When, wet, when, wet, when Red Hook was hit by Hurricane Sandy, electricity, water, and heating went down, went down for two weeks. This is actually what led them to develop the Red, the Red Hook Wi-Fi initiative. As a community member, or as a visitor, you're invited to look at the progress that they're making online. The green circles represent where they've actually set up Wi-Fi and where you can access the internet as a community member or visitor. And the yellow quarters, just as importantly, represent the areas where they would like to set up Wi-Fi. And they're hoping to work with both commercial and local residents to make that happen. In mid-September, Federal government announced the launch of a new Smart Cities initiative, which plans to invest more than 160 million federal research funds towards local communities to help them tackle key challenges, such as reducing traffic congestion, managing the effects of climate change, and economic development. More of these quantified communities are coming online soon. The funding is there. The technology is there. But the question still remains, which of these communities is going to go online next? Are we envisioning more Red Hooks? Or are we envisioning more Hudson Yards? As designers, shouldn't we be thinking about and discussing which future model of the quantified community we want to create? And as community members, which is the version we want to live in? As we develop and introduce more models of the quantified community, as designers, don't we need to consider who we're designing for? And as community members, don't we need to make sure that we're being represented? As technologists and government workers, don't we need to take a closer look at what we're measuring and in the process, what we're prioritizing, and what and who we're discounting. With all of this extra intelligence, shouldn't we be able to make sure that we're not creating two versions of community? One which is quantified and resilient, and one which isn't? As designers and community members, maybe we need to develop some design guidelines for when we go about designing smart cities, so that in the process, we make sure that our platforms and our processes are open and transparent, 
are inclusive of the diversity of the communities we belong to and represent, and are responsive to the real-time experiences and reactions of our community. As cities change with the integration of technology, and as the design of our cities become more data-driven and iterative, how must we, as citizens, also evolve? If we hope to influence their design to meet our needs and represent our interests, as designers, we have a responsibility to make sure that we represent the broader interests of the community. What we measure says a lot about what and who we value. Let's make sure that what we measure emulates both what we value as designers and as community members. And as community members, let's make sure to participate and ask informed questions of our designers. We also need to change. We need to shift from being passive generators and consumers of data to being thoughtful and active participants in the new data economy. The future of our cities and communities will quickly be quantified and determined by economic interests unless we as civic members decide to intervene. Thank you.